Good morning, everybody. We are here live on Collider Video with Thrones Talk. If you're watching later, don't worry. You can still join the conversation using the hashtag Thrones Talk as we break down, react, and, well, just quake on our boots <laughs> over some, some stuff we've been waiting to see for a long time on Game of Thrones. We are here to break it down, react, and try to figure, it, figure our hearts out here. <laughs> with me is Rachel Cushing. Hello, everybody. This episode, I still don't know if I'm going to be completely coherent about it. We have seen it three times, and it just blew me away. It, it like a like a fine flame. <laughs> John Roca is here as well. Fire! That's all I'm thinking about is fire. Fire! I woke up early, watched it again before I came. That's my third time. Just like Rachel took a shower, and got ready. I'm all ready to do the, make this happen. Let's do this. Let's do this. And <laughs> with me. As always, Dennis Zen. Yeah, for me, I, I, I didn't watch it until later last night, and so I was getting text messages and tweets, <laughs> yes. and, and I was trying to avoid any spoilers. And, and you know, and then when you're watching the episode, you're like, because you know something big must have happened mm -hmm. yeah. if, if everyone's doing yep. that. And then I was just like, waiting and waiting and waiting. And then it delivered. You were, I couldn't watch this episode till 11 p.m. last <gasps> oh night. Oh, my God. So wow. I literally had to just throw my phone into the water. Exactly. Just like, uh, guys, all right, here, here's how we're going to do this. Normally, we we, we, uh, we, we we get together before the show. We go over a format. We've done that a little bit, but we, for the most part, have just been talking about them, dragons. So uh, for you, the audience, just so we know, we're going to spend a lot of time at the end talking about what that was at the end, what we saw, where we're going to go with Danny. We're going to talk about some stuff up top, too, so I don't want you to get impatient. We will get to the dragons, but there's other important things in this episode that we do want to break down. But first, I'm going to get a get an overall feel for what, yeah, I can tell we all liked it, but it did something to, to me, John, talk, you, you and I were talking about it off yeah, air. Yeah. I, we, when this episode ended, I thought, did I overact to that right, and you right. had the same thought yeah yeah i felt like i was am i overreacting to this like i, I was slamming uh, the wall i was going insane i was doing <laughs> there was a moment there where i jumped up out of the couch and hid behind my wall and watched like with one eye because i was like this is so amazing that i can't believe this has happened like we're finally getting danny on the dragon attacking yeah. the lannisters not Mirene, not stuff out in the bay or slavers bay not uh, like legitimate yeah. we've been waiting six plus seasons to see yeah. finally having and it's so glorious Glorious. I mean, it was so glorious that I almost felt like I don't deserve it. Like, I was like, I'm not worthy <laughs> to watch this amazing, beautiful destruction. It so, was yeah. glorious. 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 <laughs> I will be there. I will be there, Rachel. <laughs> You've been waiting for this since you started reading the books in the mid-90s. Clearly. I mean, there's so many things, and obviously the Field of Fire battle, and we'll talk about some yeah. of the significances from the books with that. It it We've seen great battles on this show, yeah. but this did something different. And in they up their game. Like, I don't know how they keep doing that, and that's crazy to me, yeah. but it wasn't even just that. I'm sorry, we got three Starks in one place, yeah. and, and I got chills, and there were so many moments in this episode, funny moments, scary moments, beautiful moments, where I was, like, exclaiming out loud, and, and that is just a sign to me of one of the best episodes they've ever done. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It was something there. We are going to get the history of Field of Fire, what that meant, and a lot of, a lot of history yeah. in those caves as well. Dennis, you and I watching it late. Yes. We should have, we should have been texting each other. Exactly. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> but, but, you know, the good thing about that is, especially when it delivers, that anticipation. So I'm watching the episode going, what's going to go on? Because, you know, yeah. it starts off kind of slow. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, what is everyone talking about? Someone going to die, all these things. And then the final end, and this is what I thought, is like p the pure power and devastation of the dragon is something we've... I don't think ever seen on this scale before. I mean, yeah. I, I'm sorry. To, you know, I love Lord of the Rings, Hobbit, mm. whatever. The second Hobbit <laughs> film with, with Smog has some of that, right, 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 right. but not to this extent. We don't see the kind of the powerlessness of man right. versus the, the giant <laughs> beast of the dragon. <laughs> and we got it in spades in this episode. So I, I think, yeah, even though it's something like, oh, we've seen dragons before and other, th we've never seen a dragon like this before. We've yeah. never seen a dragon, John, laying napalm down on <laughs> My that jungle. World. It smelled like victory. <laughs> that was amazing. You know, I, I know you've seen Reign of Fire. You've probably seen that Dennis Quaid one, that weird one that came out with all the dragons, Sean Connery doing the voice. Nothing has dragon compared heart, to Dragonheart. Dragon heart. Yeah, nothing has compared to this. This was just beautiful. And I think Rachel makes great points. We, we've we been waiting all this time for the uh, Starks to find yeah. each other again, and it was almost like second Billy. 
yeah. to this whole war, yeah. which is, and people have been complaining like, oh, the battle scenes aren't so good. About this is why you have these kind of smaller battles to lead it to something glorious like this. So everything was laid out well, and then we had great character development throughout the show. We got to get back in touch with Braun. We got some more Brienne. Like we've been desperately needing more of them in the show, and we've enjoyed seeing the central people. But those other people around the fringes, they decorate the show so beautifully. And so to see them have their separate, I mean, that whole Arya Brienne fight, which I'm sure we'll get mm -hmm. to. That was that's maybe the best sword fight I've seen in such a long time on screen. So there was so much in the it show. It was really good. As Dennis said, it did start slow and calm, which mm. should be a lesson. When something starts like that, <laughs> we know something's going. It started the march out of Highgarden. And there's some interesting, you know, technical notes here. Randall Tarley saying the gold is safe in King's Landing. So we know Cersei's got her payment for the Iron Bank. We'll talk about that. Uh, Jamie's disturbed because he just found out Elena Tyrell. Eh, killed your boy. Uh, Bronn's not getting what he's deserved, but there's some stuff in here where Bronn's talking about wanting Highgarden. Can I have that castle? And Jamie's <laughs> like, I don't think you want it because we're still at war. Danny could just come and take it. That was a big warning for what was going on here. Rachel, Braun, he's still around. He's our favorite scoundrel. He's still sticking around. It was so fun to have him come back and be the Braun that we know. And I and I love his character throughout the, the series, and he's much bigger than he is in the books. But he's the more common folk perspective, and we see a lot of that in this episode, especially in comparison to, like, Dickon later on. And, and I just love his sort of, sort of irreverent attitude and his banter with Jamie and trying to get Jamie to open up to him and... Yeah. And then claiming his gold isn't enough. And the, it's just very brawn, but also sort of like ticked a box in my head. I was like, oh, we're getting a lot of brawn. I'm like, what does this mean? Like, what is what is he about to do? What's about to happen to him? So yeah, it was, yeah. I, I, I had this sort of that moment of like, all right, this is going to go somewhere because this is the most brawn we've had in a while. It's, it's also another calling card of Game of Thrones. If a character has a nice, sweet, funny, mm -hmm. endearing moment, chances are, John, he's not sticking around. <laughs> yeah. But brawn's around and brawn said this, I'm sure Queen Cersei's reign will be quiet and peaceful, to which Jamie said stranger things have happened. Bronze Could like, that be what? a prediction? <laughs> That's pretty much a prediction, I think so, too. And also, there's a great line um, that Jamie said, you don't want that cast. The more, think of the upkeep. The more you own, the more it weighs you down. I think there were oh, levels yeah. to mm -hmm. that line, definitely. And Bronn, thing about Jamie Lannister as a character is that everyone else around Jamie humanizes him. Jamie yeah. doesn't humanize himself. We don't have a lot of quiet moments with Jamie Lannister where he's having introspective conversations with himself. It's Braun, it's Brienne, it's we now cheering for him against Cersei. Like he is very much one of these characters that's decorated by the people around him. And when Braun's around him, he's a completely different person. He's like hanging out with his boy, you know, or his like one of his friends, college friends, whatever, and you see another side to Jamie that's relatable and understandable and you see him being introspective. And you know, Braun was was needling him with that whole did did, did uh, uh, old lady Tyrell get a little prick in the balls before this <laughs> so you know that's that kind of banter you have with your friend and so it's great to see that decoration but you see the weight of mm -hmm. what Jamie is carrying because mm -hmm. he's trying to have one foot in the good place and one foot in the bad place and we see in Game of Thrones all the time yeah. when you try to do you try to go exist in the middle you get crushed yeah that gray area Dennis you mentioned this was an interesting start to a big episode just from a technical standpoint a storytelling point was that a effective starting nice and calm yeah yeah they wanted to set up not only just the battle sequence but they wanted to show you jamie and braun who are very much connected to Tyrion, who is on the other side which right. plays into into the episode later that you're looking at people that you at least generally people like these two characters and feel like okay they aren't the, like Cersei, like a bad person, right. and, and and seen in Braun, you know, we hadn't seen him in a while. Uh, we saw him in, a, I think, a, a glancing shot last week, but now we we actually got into his character. He had one of those funny lines when he talked to Dickon. He's like, when he's talking about the smells of battle, yes. and he, he's like. Well, men shit themselves when they die, and they didn't right. teach you that in fancy lab fancy school. Lab school. <laughs> fancy so I, I, school. I thought that was funny. It was classic brawn. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so then let's let's actually go quickly to the Iron Bank. Then we'll go to the other stuff. Let's do a little switch uh, from our order before the show. Yeah. Oh, the Iron Bank happened. Now I will say Randall Tarley actually confirms that later about the gold. So at this point, we don't know that the gold is back in King's Landing. But uh, Tycho Nestoris, he'll be happy, and he is happy for now. This. This was probably the only, th not throwaway scene, Rachel, but this this is imp could be important because the Iron Bank's backing is something that Cersei, as she says, needs because she needs to rebuild her army, her navy, and everything else. So there's there's some importance to the scene. Yeah, there were some tidbits that I really liked. I really liked, because um, it kind of parallels what I just mentioned, um, 
Tycho says to Cersei, I'm neither kind nor a lord. And I liked, the, again, the, the, the calling to some people are highborn, some people are lowborn, and the dynamics that happens between people like that. I also love the little nod to the Golden Company. I don't think that necessarily yeah. will play out yeah. per se, but, you know, that she's looking overseas for her own, you know, right. sellsword army and whatnot. And, um, and, it, and it is, it's, it's a, it's a side to war that rarely gets depicted in movies and television, and that's the money side. And Dennis has mentioned this mul multiple yeah. times, and I love that this show does recognize that that plays a part. You can't just come up with armies and supplies on nothing. And, right. um, and I love Mark Gaddis, and I love the, his dynamic with Cersei. Like, she kind of looks bored with him at some points, and then she's kind of sparring with him. And, and it, it'll be curious to see if there's even more to that or if that's right. just to just keep us thinking about the gold and where it is at any given time in the episode. Right. Gold is important, Dennis, there. could If Cersei loses the support, where where did they go? Where would the Iron Bank go? I don't know. But, I mean, there is kind of a turn with them before because we saw right. them with, with Stannis and even in the beginning dealings with Cersei and the Lannisters, there seemed to be kind of a more neutral aspect to right. it where in this episode you kind of saw like more of the greed and like oh okay once we get that gold we're good yeah we're good we'll be you know the and you know he talked about missing actually the the, the interest, interest payments now yeah. that it's all fully yeah, paid yeah. back so we I, need your money too exactly so now, now they want to like loan that money back to them right yeah. absolutely john you know that uh mm -hmm. you've been in the military you got yeah. someone's got to pay for those uniforms and that food and those rations and and the weapons so yep. this is a tiny scene with a big implications for you, Cersei. You can have all the plans in the world. If, if you can't carry them out because you don't have the money for it, what's the point, you know? And you right. see this here. And it's, it's such a great juxtaposition to what we saw in the last episode where he seemed like he was judging her and, mm -hmm. you know, like, in, in, like it had the advantage. She has quickly turned it around. And you see him, like, following behind her now mm -hmm. and going, like, we'd like to fund you. We'd like to yeah. give you money. Like, <laughs> it's amazing how that turns around when you show up with a good credit report. You know, it's yeah. amazing how they want to give you money Absolutely. like crazy. So we see that there. And I love that this continuing relationships. You go, I'm a huge fan of Mark Gaddis, and so yeah. to see him continuing this relationship with Cersei is great. And I, that last line he said, oh, you know, as soon as we get the gold, mm -hmm. you know, her look at him is like, I would cut you to pieces if I could, <laughs> if I could. but for right now, I need yeah. you. Oh, and by the way, that stuff's out of my hair. I walk under trees, so sometimes things go <laughs> to my hair. Thank you for taking that out, Ken. Thank you. Uh, anytime I can reach into your hair, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next big thing is Winterfell. A lot going on at Winterfell right now. Um, we've got Baelish and Bram, Mira Lee leaving Arya returns Sansa sees what she's become they have a great meeting below the crypts uh, we got as John mentioned a, a, a training sparring session for the ages and Bran man he is still taking a lot of acid and his brain <laughs> is a little bit fried let's dig in Rachel to what's going on at Winterfell and I want to start with someone who's not a Stark, but he's up to something. Peter Baelish and that cat's paw dagger. What's mm. going on there? I loved this scene. I mean, it's Peter being Peter, and we all know how much I love Peter being Peter. He's right. just so smarmy and schmoozy, and I just felt like the scene was meant to establish that, like, now he's trying to get in with who the potential Lord of Winterfell. He even calls him that. Now, Bran has said multiple times that... that, that he is not and will not go after that claim. But Peter will play every angle available to him at every time, and I liked that. But I also found it really interesting, this idea that, like, Peter sort of mirrored Brienne in this episode in the, the fact of, like, they both are trying to honor Catelyn in their own ways and, and honor the vows that they made to her and looking after her children and having them all in one place is just really interesting from both of, both of their perspectives. The dagger, I'm so curious about mm. this thing. Like, because Bran doesn't say a lot in the scene, but he's like, where did this come from? And that's the big question because that's yeah. the question that started the War of the Five L Kings. Literally because so. it was Peter who started the yeah. War of the Five <laughs> Kings. Yeah. And so there's that, but I feel like there's an older, like there's something more to it because we saw well, its, its picture it's, it's in, in Sam's yeah. book at Old Town. So, like, where did this dagger come from? It's Valerian steel, so that is clearly important. And I think its history is going to come out in a little bit bigger of a sense. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I mean, just the, my first, you know, big squeal of the episode was when Peter was talking about Bran and buttering him up and saying, you know, must have been so hard and going through all the chaos that you've gone through. And then Bran says, chaos is a ladder. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, this confirms what a lot of us were thinking and that 
Bran knows what Peter did. Yeah. And right. that's going to come back to haunt him. And, and, and John, I want to bring you in on that point there. Yeah. there. yeah, a lot going on. This this cat spot dagger's got something. Yeah. Arya's got a Valyrian steel blade, blade, so she can go fight Walker, right. White Walkers. That's great. But yeah, Baelish is a used car salesman here. Yeah. I don't believe for one sec. I believe part of his heart about Catelyn. But I overall don't believe him, and Bran's kind of calling him on his shit right here. Yeah, he is, because he can and that's the thing. And this is what struck me this time around. Because Brand, Brand is basically like that like that friend of yours that went to college, listened to one alternative rock album, and now is judging your entire music collection all the time. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't listen to that. It used to be me. I'm different now. You know, it's really weird to deal with him. And, and you know, we don't because we've been waiting for this reunion for a long time with the Starks to get together. And every time they, he has almost no emotion. And the way he dismissed Mira was even, yeah. oh, even was more cold. terrible. You know, you, we've all been in that relationship where the person cares less about you than you care about them. <laughs> and that was basically a window into that situation. Uh, that's all you have to say? Thank you. I did all this for you. Thank you. That's all you get. But what I liked about this, though, is it made me question Bran's role in this whole situation. Right. Because like you said, Rachel, chaos is a ladder. I wrote that down. That's my favorite line of the scene. And this speaks to whether Bran is going to warn people or not, warn his own family or not, because I remember being Brandon Stark. That's a very huge line for him to mm -hmm. say. It means that whatever's going to happen, he sees four, five, ten steps ahead of everybody else of why certain things are supposed to happen. So will he warn his sisters if danger is about to fall on them or Jon Snow or anyone else? Or does he see like this is supposed to happen so that this stuff happens three steps four further down the road? So it, it, it really throws a huge X factor into this whole situation. I love that they're setting this up. And even the reunion with Arya was so emotionless, and he yeah. gave her the dagger. So right. there's there's a lot here to explore. Yeah, Dennis, Bran, <laughs> Bran has, let's be honest, it's sometimes been one of the more boring storylines. Yes. Yeah. It's been it's exposition, it's been great flashbacks. We all like Bran, we feel for the kid, yeah. he got pushed out, anything, anything, what we do for love, boom, it loses his legs. Yeah. But now, as John said, he's an X-Factor. How, how does this start to factor Bran in more. Yeah, because we don't know if he has any loyalties or if he's even on a side, if he's mm -hmm. just purely neutral. Because what Roka is saying is true. Is he going to take any of the knowledge that he has and is he going to give it to, to his sisters or his brother? Or is it just one of those things where he has it and it's just there because yeah. he knows when when he gets that dagger from, from Baelish, he knows where this dagger's been, who gave it to who, why. He he already knows that, that Baelish was the one who implemented basically the start of this whole crazy, right. uh, you know, uh, the whole Game of Thrones mm -hmm. storyline by, yeah. by by plotting to kill uh, John Aaron with uh, Lysa. Yeah. So he knows all these things. Mm -hmm. So as he's sitting across from him, he's got all the advantages and, and you know, and then he kind of, kind of, uh, teases that little line that like oh how does he know that so yeah. Baelish was kind of uh, uncharacteristically thrown off. He's yeah, Never he's seen kind of him thrown, like that. Yeah, yeah, he's been kind of thrown off a lot there. And then with the stuff with with Mira and it, 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 going back to Brand to your point, Dennis, like. Isaac Hampstead Wright has said that Bran is, is all this information's in his head at once, and that's kind of why it's coming out as kind of catatonic. Mm -hmm. he, he's just kind of like all the information's being doo -doo -doo matrix into his brain. Mm -hmm. So is he withhold? I think he's withholding information because he knows it, but at the same yeah. time, is he still trying to process what all of it means? That might be one of the bigger questions because, as Mira pointed out, Rachel, he died in that cave, yeah. and just like. Bran is no longer Bran, just like Brendan Rivers, the Blood Raven, was no longer the Blood Raven when he became the Three-Eyed Crow or Three-Eyed Raven, uh, and, and that's who Bran's taken over. I don't subscribe to the theory that Bran is also the old Three-Eyed Raven, because that, to me, is Brendan Rivers, yeah. and there's a whole history there with that character, but that character died in that cave, too. Bran died in that cave. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of parallels with that, and I love the nods to the books in that respect, and that's great, but it's there's so many factors in terms of, like we said, is he good or is he neutral but I think it's also it's sort of like the Melisandre aspect mm -hmm. where she has powers but can't control them all the time like has the visions but then misinterprets them yeah. and he could be going through something similar it's it's probably chaotic in mm -hmm. his brain and his ultimate goal is defeat the Night King would if it took sacrificing his family to do so, would he do so? I kind of, I'm leaning towards, I think he would. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why he's being, you know, it, it's easier to close off the emotions. And, and, you know, Mira says to him, you died in that cave and he didn't deny it. And I think Bran Stark in a way is dead. And the three-eyed raven is this sort of almost inhuman entity who's got a bigger purpose in the world. Mm -hmm. And right. Bran's trying to deal with that. Right.
Well, that chaos is a ladder line. It's just the greatest because it's just like ladder to what? Climbing up it. it you know, everything is going to start slamming into itself and he's going to be the only one that can see why it's happening. And so mm -hmm. that's going to give him an advantage over everybody in the whole situation, including Melisandre. Yeah, so. absolutely. Uh, Arya <laughs> is back home. Yay. This is an emotional <laughs> return. This is something we've been waiting for since season one. It's Arya has spent her entire life, entire run of the show, other than uh, her two years in college, um, mm -hmm. being so close. The Hound almost had her there. Uh, Yorn was taking her up there. This this is, of all the reunions, of all the returns to Winterfell, this is one that maybe got me the most because this is perhaps the person who wanted to get back the most and it meant so much and she had so, come so close. Arya also has trouble entering open gates with guards. Yes. Yes. This happens yeah. a lot. But she got in. Uh, let's talk about this return, Dennis. Home is not quite home for Arya, but she is back. Yeah, I mean, it starts off with that wonderful shot of her riding up on, onto the hill mm. and you see the camera kind of cranes from the bottom up revealing Winterfell and this is the first time that she's seen it she, since she left I think episode 2 of season 1 yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so she has not been back since then and then like you said she had trouble with those guards <laughs> um, but I mean you know, she's, she's a different person and just, just being there and, and seeing the Stark banner and just looking around like you, like so much has changed so much yeah. has happened and, and her reunion with Sansa was not they didn't try and pull at the heartstrings they weren't trying to like manipulate you it was emotional but at the same time reserved because yeah. of mm -hmm. both of their characters and what they've both gone through they both have yeah. changed completely since they they last saw each other and, yeah. and you know and Jon Snow's not there and then of course with, with Bran because he's like totally you know out of it they, they have this kind of uh, three stark reunion but it's not it's really not complete because Arya you know, uh, when, when Sansa tells her that, that Bran is here, she the way she delivers it is like, yeah, Bran's here too, but she's uh, she's she's not a... Uh, Hold on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I do love the stuff about the list. You yeah. know, every time Arya tells someone about her killing people on the list, they just kind of laugh and laugh yeah, at her. Yeah, that's one of my favorite moments. I've got a list of people want to kill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you're right, Dennis. This was a, a reunion we've been waiting for since episode yeah. one or episode two maybe at the most or, you know, later on. But Bran and everyone kind of separates. And, and it was definitely, it had some scars to it that we we've been along in that journey too yeah and Sansa and Arya were never close they always yeah. they were yeah. they always fought with each other because they were so different but you know just like how Sansa and, and Jon Snow weren't very close either right but now you know she's waiting and hopefully uh she she has a reunion with Jon Snow because I know you know Needle is yeah is from him that was one of uh and, and, and you're sorry I like how the scene played out John because yeah. This is a reunion that we wanted. It's a big reunion. Dennis is right. They used to fight, but they, you know they love each other. It's right. in the crypts before father. And there's some... I wanted Ari to have some emotions, and she did. There was little moments when she hugged her, little mm -hmm. moments when she hugged her again. But the Jon Snow part, Arya's face lit up. That yeah. is... That is her guy, man. That, yeah. That's why she has Needle. That's been carrying her for so long. Yeah, yeah, and I think it makes us more, even more excited to see that reunion when it does happen. And this is so great because the way she walks in those guards, it's perfect because that's what the show does for you, right? You want to buy into this idea of, like, it's going to be a happy reunion. But you get, like, fuck off. You know, you yeah. get that kind of thing. You know, you get, And that's a perfect way. And it's so perfect for Arya to be met that way because she gets to have a battle of wits with these two dummies back and forth and then eludes them. And then where she finds where Sansa finds her downstairs, uh, or not downstairs, but down in that cave with, <laughs> with well, yeah, I guess it works <laughs> in, in the basement. front of their dad, and then they comment about his face, yeah. like it should have been done by someone who actually remembers his face. Where they, and, and then she says this, which I love, which I thought was meta for both uh, Sophie and Maisie was. Our stories aren't done yet. Like our right. stories are not yeah. being. That, it's such a like both because the, they've grown up on the show, yeah. and we see them. And Jen, Dennis, you mentioned the shot of her. Arya is so strong now. Yeah. The yeah. shot above, you saw her, and even the way she strutted in to face Brienne, uh, she strutted in from the sh the shot was from below, and the way she strutted in is not a young girl anymore mm -hmm. who doesn't know what to do. Yeah. There's a power in that, and so when they have their emotional moment on underneath, it is reserved because you mentioned Den uh, uh, Ken. The laughing is so brilliant of yeah. the list, and then who I love Sansa going. 
who else is on your list? Like that <laughs> question means so much because everyone has, and, and life has a way of, of humbling your ass if you're too cocky. It also has a way of uh, making you see the world in a, in, a, in a bigger way once you leave home. So, yeah. and you see that in their embrace. Like it's, it's a cordial embrace, it's a respectful embrace, but it's also their, all, their own people, they're their yeah. own people, and I love that. And I love that it's a little bit of Aria live there when she gets mm. excited about John, she hugs, hugs Sansa. And, and, and Rachel, this is perhaps, again, one of the most important reunions because these are the last two Starks who saw Ned Stark alive. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else had no knowledge. I mean, they knowledge, but they know no no visual other than Bran now. Right. But <laughs> th they were there. This was a long time coming. Absolutely. Like, and and they don't. And I'm sure it's going to be like one of those off camera conversations. They they allude to you know we both have long unpleasant stories, yeah. but then like John said, like Arya says, but our stories are still going, which is a really sweet uplifting note. But I. My favorite part of this whole interaction and over the series of the scenes was Sansa's sort of realization of who Arya has become right. and, and, and her you know, the comical reaction to the list, but then realizing when Bran corroborates it and then when she sees the fight with Brienne, like Sansa's sort of like taken aback. And, and in a way, Arya sort of fulfilled her destiny. She always wanted, she never wanted to be a lady. She wanted yeah. to be a fighter. And Sansa always wanted to be a great lady. So they fulfilled those in a weird way. But Sansa sees Arya as a little girl at the, the first mm -hmm. time they come together in the crypt. And then over the course of their yeah. scenes together, she realizes that like, wow, her story really is something probably terrible. And she's turned into... Yeah, I mean, she's a killer, right. and, and and Sansa is too in a way, but like not in the same. And I, I feel like that that dynamic is still going to continue growing, and I love that they're sisters. They love each other. They had the really the second hug was what got me yeah. because clearly Arya was leaning into mm. that moment. But I I think that there's still a lot to come with them fully realizing what they've each been through and what does that mean for them going forward. And, and as viewers, it's like we've all been on these journeys with them, and so we got yeah. wrapped up in the stories. But, yeah, if you go back to season one and they were all together, those final goodbye shots, the, these moments where they, you know, you know, what happened to you? It's a long story. Yours is probably a long story, too. And then Bran's like, yeah, I see quite a lot now. Mm -hmm. um, I, as, as a viewer, much like, say, a reader, when you get to the end of a 2,000-page book and you look back, you're like, wow, I went on a journey. We've <laughs> all been on this journey with, with, with them, which is why I think this reunion means just as much to us, Dennis. This yeah. is important. Yeah, and then, it, you know, Arya, I like her line, do I call you Lady Stark? <laughs> <laughs> and then Sansa big. actually yes. answers, yes. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that that scene too. After the fight with uh, Brienne, you see yeah. Sansa starting to realize, oh, she's not joking about that mm -hmm. list. This is a yeah. totally different person than than when we last met. Mm -hmm. And let's to be honest, there's probably a th part of Sansa that's like, wait, am, am I, I on that list? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. She, we did not get along, John. <laughs> we did course. not get along. That, that that line had like multiple levels at it, you know. And she probably is thinking about Littlefinger too. There's probably a number yeah. of people that she would think about. I mean, they talk about Joffrey. You yeah, know, he's, I wish you'd done it. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's there's a bloodlust in Arya, and I find that line w that I mentioned earlier with mm -hmm. this whole idea of their stories that's a foreshadowing line. Could you know, be, could both. be. There might be a lot in here. Bran finally takes some credit for you know again. I I understand what Bran's saying. I didn't do a lot, but she did do a lot, and and some one way or another, the, the Stark children, mm. rest in peace, Rickon, mm. not and Rob, not back. <laughs> Not uh, our back. And so this, this some good Brienne moments here, Rachel. I loved Pod, you know, saying to her, like, good for you for sticking to your vow and, and for fulfilling it. And, and you know, Brienne's, like, n didn't want to take credit for it, doesn't also want to be called a lady, but pauses a moment and, and mm. accepts the, the compliment. And then I think that that says something about Brienne, too. And there's just something so beautiful about her faith throughout the entire series right. and like her she never gave up even though there were so many moments when she should have and could have and she never did and it it just for somebody who who's like that who's a giver who 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 believes in service and and to have it fulfilled in this way it makes me a little worried yeah. about her yeah. and the end like you know dying for one of the for one of them or, or whatnot but I mean I know that she would go out the way she's been this entire time right. which is a very loyal faithful and incredible fighter and that that right. sparring session was a thing of beauty mm -hmm. i loved you know such disparate sizes but used in such a beautiful way and 
how Arya has taken all of her dancing lessons from Sirio Forwell all the way through everything she learned from the Hound, everything she learned at the House of Black and White, and puts it all together to be this, you know, badass assassin type character. And the look, that like half smile on Brienne's face at the yeah. end of that match was perfect. It's great. It harkens back to when they first met, how Arya had a, had yeah. respect for her the first right. time there, and that fight was about. Uh, clashes of cultures and style, which yeah. is going to come into factor later in this episode. <laughs> yep. Let's, though, move to Dragonstone and talk some dragon glass, some paintings on the caves. Mm. There was a lot going on as we were building up anticipation for, as Dennis and I knew, something big, thanks to the <laughs> tweets and texts coming in. Um, there, there's a lot. First of all, I'm wearing my Stannis Baratheon shirt for a reason. <laughs> all right? Stannis was the king by right. He may have lost his way a little bit, but he said at one point... Just a little bit. Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> a little I mean, bit. Bur burn your own daughter. Stannis said at one point, yeah. dragon glass. Kill your brother. We got mountains of dragon glass where I came from. No one listened. No one listened to Stannis. Um, but here we are now. They are in the caves. The same caves, actually, that Danny passed on her way into Dragonstone. Mm -hmm. Just took a little right turn. You would have seen all this stuff. We've got, we've got John. We got a lot going on in the caves. We got the children mm -hmm. of the forest with yeah. the warning, chills moments. That next, mm -hmm. I, I'm back when Osha said, "I keep telling your brother he's marching the wrong way." Mm -hmm. The the scene, the cave painting of the White Walkers gave me some chills. And we got, we got some, we got some heat in that cave, John. Uh, mm -hmm. There's something about Jon Snow and ladies in caves. I mean, yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah, that's where he makes his best moves, you know. Yeah. So I'm like, so to me, those of us who know, you know, this connection with John, we're like, this feels a little creepy, but all right. I mean, I bought Star Wars, I guess. I guess. So let's see, let's see where this plays out. But I like that it was there, and you get that element. And, and Davos brings it up later when he's right. walking with them. Mm -hmm. He goes, Oh yeah, it's sure, it's her heart you're looking at. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's those kinds of things. So I love this, but it's also a way for John to get a little more credibility with Danny. It was perfect, yeah. showing her the the draw and her amazement at it all because this is her. She home. was amazed. Yeah, yeah, she was, and this is her home, and to know that this was here the whole time, and she hadn't, didn't get a chance to see it, and then when she sees the images of the White Walkers, but Danny is driven, and yeah. Danny turns it and says, I will absolutely fire for you, and we're like caught up with yeah, this, like, yeah. you hear the music sweeping yeah, yeah. up, we're like, yes, and then she goes, as soon as you bend a knee, and it's like, <laughs> yeah. so there's this, she's just, she just, is, so she has her terms, and she will not break from those terms, yeah. which we see later on, and what she was seeing in the preview for the next episode might be something dangerous, but I like that they have this moment. It once again it, it, it solidifies their connection and, and deepens it even more. And you you said I like what you said. You said driven because yeah. often Danny's written off as stubborn. Yes, and she's stubborn. Mm -hmm. Let's be fair. True. But at the same time, let's give her some credit. She might just be driven. Mm -hmm. She also might be turning to the dark side. We're going to talk a lot yeah, about yeah, right. that. Exactly. Um, uh, Rachel, this stuff here. We've got so much going on. The art of the long night. The uh, the this warning. This 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 chilling warning of what's going on. Um, yeah, and, and this is for John, too. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is the exact conversation he had with Mance Raider. Yeah. Mm. Just yep. come on, put aside your pride, bend the knee. And Mance says all I wanted was a choice. That's John's a got point. that choice and faced with it. He's making the same decision. It's a, such an incredible scene for so many reasons. I loved the the, the paintings and the spiral symbol. Yeah. We've been seeing that throughout the seasons. And we know after last season that the children of the forest were the creators of the White Walkers. And so there's a connection there. And I love the paintings depicting a, a truce, an uneasy right. truce, but a truce between the children of the men, uh, children of the forest and the first men. And John talks about how they fought together against a common enemy, despite their differences, despite their suspicions of each other. And he's like, and we need to do that. And in that moment, when she's looking at the paintings and she's looking at him and he's he's so earnest and like true, she she gets it. She gets him in that moment, but then snaps back to Danny. And the thing, the <laughs> yeah. hardest part for me of that is she makes a decent point about the idea of if yeah. he says that the northerners will not accept a southern ruler after everything we've been through and she's like they will if their king does mm -hmm. that's, that's true uh, no, and, absolutely and you should do it because it's in because it's the best thing for your people and this is what a lot of people have been arguing as to why he would bend the knee so she's articulating the right things like in order to survive this is the thing that you should do but and you should then she says the thing that pisses me off which is you know, and do do what you need to do for the survival of your people and not for your pride. And I'm sitting there going, pot, kettle, black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, you're talking to him about pride? Like, yeah. what are you doing right now? You are demanding people bend the knee for what reason? And we have this beautiful speech from Missandei later mm -hmm. that helps explain that 
people have chosen her as their queen, not because of who her father was. But John's not there yet. The yeah. people of Westeros aren't there yet. So why does Danny expect them to be? The, uh, she cannot expect them to just bend the knee for whatever right. reason. Like, there's... Yeah. It, it was so nuanced and driven and good until the word pride was pride. used well, for me. That's great. Look, again, wearing, I'm wearing the Stannis shirt for a reason. Yeah. I Legitimately, yeah. this is one of my favorite characters because I think he, it was the Iron Throne was his by right. He's the only one willing to do a lot of things right for the world. But <laughs> personal, are, you, are you insane? Personal <laughs> vengeance. He sent yeah. a demon to kill his brother. Like, what are you talking about? Well, he also he's, burned, he's burned his daughter. He's the only <laughs> one willing to do an yeah. attack yeah. for the He was right definitely the willing to do an attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But Talk he, about driven. he yeah. got lost in personal agenda, stubbornness, mm -hmm. pride. That is Stannis' story. That is what is a lesson for everybody. You're right. going to end up dead under a tree, even then, though he still respects Bran at the end for doing it the right way. So I'm watching Danny kind of do the same thing because yeah. this is all hers by right, mm -hmm. and you've got a lot of good things going, and you're going to start taking this turn. I do want to get your thoughts mm -hmm. on this, Dennis, but to jump mm -hmm. in, you said stuff with Missandei. You yeah. took it as a positive thing, right? I loved her speech. I took it as a warning. Yes. Oh, okay. I took it as a warning that yeah. they're talking to Missandei going, really? Really? <laughs> this is like someone, a friend of yours in that bad relationship and you're like, oh, is that oh. what you think? Mm. <laughs> oh, also, also, also real quick, I think the Missandei yeah. works too because it's a foreshadowing. Yeah. She mm -hmm. said, well, if, if you wanted to go back home, uh, she would get me a ship. If something happens to Grey Worm, she's going to want to jump on a ship and go, and I and guarantee Danny you Dan is going to stop her. Like, no, kid. And that's going to change stuff. Dan, it's a lot to unpack here. I want to get you into this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, w w Rachel was talking about that pride line. Yeah, you th I thought it was as well, because you this last episode, you were talking about, I believe, I believe in Daenerys Targaryen, <laughs> myself, you know? <laughs> she's like talking in a third person. So yeah. obviously pride is a, a big factor <laughs> yeah. in, her, in, in her decisions. Uh, yeah, and all, all the stuff in the cave. Uh, yeah, I did think of that too as well, Roka, about yeah. Jon Snow has a lot of big things happen in caves. <laughs> yeah. um, but but, but the, the paintings on it's the like wall. It's like when you go to your favorite restaurant over and over oh, with I, different yeah. women. Is that it, John? Is that what it is? Maybe. Yeah, uh, uh. just the, the paintings on the wall just solidified more into what. And there's th this trust that Danny right. doesn't exactly totally believe or, or, or is behind Jon Snow, but she does trust him. I mean, yeah. the Dothraki wanted to protect her she's like no no i'm fine she right. goes into that kid if mm. he wanted to kill her he could easily right just kill her but 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 she knows that's not what his goal is she knows that he even if she's not 100 percent behind it that he is doing what he believes is right for his people and, yeah and and i think he he trusts her in that way she, too she respects him i believe yeah. and it's mm. interesting you know, danny at one point wanted to break the wheel dennis she's becoming the wheel yeah that's yeah. a danger yeah and th that's why when she asked you know first of all she gets pissed off at Tyrion about Mary. his uh, yeah. uh, oh, military man. strategy which we kind of <laughs> well we kind, uh, of yeah. we kind of speculated that in previous episodes yeah. like after a few you know uh disappointing uh, results yeah. uh and she she asked for john snow's counsel even though she doesn't really know him very well but right. she knows that He's fought battles. And He's the, won. Yeah, and, and, and he mentions, like, you can't be more of the same because you see Danny's impatience. I mean, she's always been a very impatient uh, right. a leader. She's like, oh, I want to... You know, let's yeah. just go to the Red Keep. I got yeah. some dragons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go to the Red Keep. And, and She's got that Targaryen blood. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Jon Snow uh, wisely advises her ag against that. Right, but will she take the advice? And apparently not there. Um couple notes as we wrap up this to get to the main event. Uh, Theon returns. Yeah. Yeah. Are we ever going to have empathy for this character? Uh, Alfie I, Allen I, does a great job oh, and says does. you need to find empathy for yeah. Theon. It's not yet. I know. Well, here's the thing. I think you can have empathy for him, but still you know despise the moves being made per se like yeah. e there's n you can never you can't go back in history and change history you can't go back and undo the, his betrayal of rob stark which ultimately led to his death you cannot undo that he may not have murdered brandon rickon but he did murder two other little boys and the, he had he is haunted by his past and he will forever be haunted by his past and john is a reminder he was not expecting in that moment mm, of wow. everything and and clearly his mind is he needs to find a way to save yara because you know she, yeah. he couldn't in the moment um from two episodes ago but i i love the simplicity of just john grabbing him and being like 
it, for what you did for Sansa is the only reason why you're not dead right, right. now. And that's a very John thing to do. <laughs> and it's a very Theon moment. <laughs> and it basically, though, was then just a, a sort of setup for the line of, like, where's Danny? Oh, she's not here. She's no. not here. She's so. been traveling. John? Yeah. You like Theon? I do. I, I do. I feel sympathy for the guy. I mean, he his moves may not have been the best moves, but saving Sansa, jumping over the side of the ship, you may not like it. It may stick in your craw. And I had uh, me as a guy who likes to fight my battles it unsettles me too but it it's kind of working out in a way in a positive because he brings they, they find him he tells them the story if he had died no one would have known the full story that he has yara nobody would have known this until later so now we have him coming and we have this uh, issue with with him but i like also earlier with this whole situation with Tyrion. this undercurrent of Tyrion's connection to the Lannisters mm -hmm. plays out a little bit later as well. What is he going... And she questions him is something I brought up, I think, uh, an episode or two ago where I said, like, Tyrion may turn on... The family bonds are very strange mm -hmm. very weird in certain moments and certain heightened moments, and she questions him. Like, she... Danny goes after him, and it, you juxtapose that with what's going on with, with mm -hmm. Theon showing up, who's more, more like a confusing military strategist. Mm -hmm. right. His mistakes, you go, oh, that's just Theon, but with Tyrion, it's a, it's a deeper well of loss, you know? Like right. you fall mm -hmm. harder off the cliff when his stuff does not work out. So I, I think this Theon stuff is going to play itself out in the way that it's supposed to, and he will have a noble death at some point. Mm, yeah, but that's why they're setting it up. A lot of, as, we, as we round up season seven, it's like Bran and, and yeah. Bran. It's like the purpose of these characters in these stories is, is starting to become more and more intriguing to yes, me. Like, yeah. why are they still here? You, a lot of people died, Dennis, but Theon's still here. Yeah, I mean, that obviously shows he has more of a purpose. Otherwise, they would have acted him a long time. I, I do have empathy for him. I mean, you yeah. can have empathy. Much like I talk about, I know you love uh, Cer Cersei, but you yeah. know, there's a, a lot of people who hate her. I have empathy for her character, less so this sure, season, sure, sure, but, yeah. but in previous seasons, you know, <laughs> like you can think of someone as a more villainous or an evil character, but you can have still have empathy for him. And I have empathy for, for yeah. Theon for what he's gone through and that he is trying to do right, even though yeah. he, he, he... He just got a lot going on. Yeah, he did a lot of <laughs> up, effed up things before. So we'll see if he has a, a, a redemptive ending or yeah. is he just going to be... like Gone kind of and gone and gone. All right, as Rachel said at the end of this seed, the queen is gone. The Queen is gone, and we go to Field of Fire, Volume 2. Now, uh, the history lesson here is Field of Fire was an incident where about 60,000 Lannister soldiers, Rachel, were in the same area, in the Reach. Mm -hmm. And you had the, the, it wasn't Tyrells, it was the Gardeners, the Gardeners. and you had uh, the Lannisters uh, marching around, acting pretty tough. Aegon comes in with his three dragons, the first and only time all three were out in the field of battle. Balerion uh, at, the, at the head, of course, very similar to Drogon, and whoo, scorched earth. Yep. All gone. The Lannisters bowed that day. The Tyrells were given heart, high garden that day. A lot of big things, and this is a little bit of history repeating itself. Yeah, it was. I loved the parallels to the Field of Fire. Anybody who's delved into the history of Westeros, and that was basically the, the final moments of the Targaryens taking over the technically six kingdoms, not seven at that point. But um, yeah, at the end of an entire house, the gardeners were wiped out and the Tyrells stepped in and the Lannisters, you know, were almost decimated and that was when they bent the knee. And the idea was that, you know, like Dennis mentioned at the beginning of this episode, that dragons are the X factor. There right. is nothing you can do <laughs> about right. them. I mean, you you can have a scorpion, and we'll talk about that. But is it enough? And and that you know that moment you know changed Westerosi history, and the Targaryens came into power. And this is Danny mimicking that. And you know, no, she's she's done with you know smart, clever plans. She's ready for head-on action. She's ready to lead the. She said, what kind of queen am I if I'm not willing to put myself out there? Which is actually a, a line I thought that John sort of right. respected mm -hmm. in, in a way. And so, yeah, just, the, you know, taking on that Targaryen mental, mantle, fire and blood, and going full force going with it. full force. This starts with some fun moments, Don, John. Uh, Dickon, uh, the, the line mm -hmm. Dennis mentioned earlier, yeah. the fancy lad school stuff. Yeah. But I love when Dickon, not love, but it's like when Dickon's talking about war mm -hmm. and what it really meant. And this is someone who has been riding high. And so mm -hmm. if you saw him, same character last season, different performer talking to Sam. But I'm great at 70 yards with, the, with killing an animal. Mm -hmm. And this is war. I, I kind of like these moments where it gets real before Braun in a callback for me to Hardhome 
home when you hear the dogs barking mm -hmm. and suddenly you're like, what's going to happen? Everybody Bron's quiet. Like, Do you hear that? Uh, <laughs> uh, that was a, a, another, much like mm -hmm. this episode, a slow start to something spectacular. It's, there's nothing more beautiful than the sound of horses' hooves on the ground from far away. Mm -hmm. And the way they shot this, this director, I think, we, have you mentioned his uh, name? We talked about Matt, Matt uh, Shackman, Matt Shackman, Matt Shackman. Uh, first time with this episode. Right, yeah, with Game of Thrones. A Game of Thrones episode, mm -hmm. right, to have that shot. And this is, do you, we've seen numerous battles on horse, yep. Braveheart, et cetera, yep. but this, to shoot it from so far away yep. to where you see them as just these ants mm -hmm. coming over the hill, it's that fear. You know, it's like, it's like it reminds me of that Monty Python where, uh, what's his face, Lancelot is running and, like, <laughs> and he seems far away and all of a sudden he's on top of you cutting you to pieces. And the Dothraki, that's the power. That's how powerful they are. You don't need a close-up shot early, mm -hmm. the long wait, and then just hearing them come and then everybody going in saying, oh, shields, get everything done. Yeah. So it just builds you as a viewer to be like, oh God, here we go, here we go, here we go. And I thought they were going to come from behind and they were just, uh, you know, <laughs> fooling them. But then when they come over the hill, it's so glorious. And then the sound of that dragon. Thank God. This, this is the setup top. It's a clash of cultures and styles. Mm. It reminded me a little bit, in, in, in terms of cinema, of The Last Mohicans, Michael mm. Mann's version, mm. where you saw the Native Americans fighting uh, the, the British soldiers, yeah. soldiers and the two different kind of styles there. This, though, Dennis, Robert Baratheon kind of spoke about this and warned about this in season one when talking to Cersei about, if it's, I believe he said of Viserys, not mm. necessarily Daenerys yeah. at the time, come over with 4,000 Dothraki horde, uh, mm. uh, you know, Dothraki riders at their side, we need one solid an army we need to be united and you're seeing right now robert predicted starting to happen yeah yeah i mean the the, the shot uh, that roca's talking about with with tiny little doth rocky yeah. horde with the, the sound <laughs> yeah, the and sound. they're coming down the hill yeah. you're just, all the tension is, is building up but then they like as as they come down it switches to that shot where where drogon and daenerys pop into frame and then <sighs> and they're it's a side shot coming towards them it, it was it was absolutely fantastic and just mm -hmm. after uh drogon actually unleashes fire like the look on dickon's mm. face the look on yeah. jamie's face it's like it, there's dread and fear and also disbelief no one's seen a dragon right. in how many years they're like oh my mm. god yeah what is this there's nothing we can do people are, are like being burnt to crisp mm. or they're they're catching on fire Fire being burnt alive, so yeah. it's it's just absolutely devastating. It, it's a Terminator Two callback here. To yeah. begin, uh, the, <laughs> turn to ashes. Yeah, uh, you mentioned it, John. We can hold them off. We're gonna be. Oh <laughs> no, uh, we got this dragon. And you know, it's funny. I, I watch this. I usually I do a pass of watching the episode, then I do a second pass to do all my notes and maybe a third if I need it. My notes just stopped at this point. There's just <laughs> little like wa to watch it and take it all in. Uh, I, I mentioned this before on the show at at the San Diego Comic Con panel. Liam Cunningham. Dobbs talked about with each battle it's not about making it bigger and better it's about doing something different yes. with it we've seen many different kind of battles mm -hmm. this time Rachel um, and we're a long way from Blackwater which <laughs> still is one of my favorite battles sure. it's it still it, it had so much tension that paid off it's a template for the battles in Game of Thrones but we are a long way away you're an editor how do you put this together <laughs> uh, this, this is a, a feat unlike any feat they've done but in a different way and that's I mean Liam Cunningham was right it's this was a battle that uh, I mean Hard Home's my favorite, but I mean, I, I got to give it up to Battle of the Bastards and Blackwater mm -hmm. and Castle Black. This was something different, and not just because of Drogon, but because of having two armies who you care about. You care about people on both sides. Mm -hmm. So when you see the devastation and the horror of what it means to be burnt alive and ashes flying around and the devastation, like Dennis was talking about, you, you have this like pit in your stomach on, for both sides, and then to have the added perspective of, I mean, we didn't get to know Dick on very well, but we yeah. had enough moments in this episode to feel for him whenever we were in his point of yep. view. And you always need points of view in a battle to make it Right. An emotional connection. So we have Jamie, we have Dickon, we have Braun, we have Tyrion up on the hill, mm -hmm. and we have Danny on Drogon. So we have so many angles with this battle yeah. that it's not just the technical amazingness and proficiency of it, it's I'm uh, oh my god I'm so scared for Jamie right now oh my god I'm so scared for Drogon right now oh my god yeah. Tyrion like what's he gonna do what's he th like there's so much going on that it hits on every level that a battle needs to it's just great storytelling John you mm -hmm. and I are pro wrestling guys we yes. know this we talk about it often here I talk about Danny going heel we use yeah. these terms this is what happens when you pit two people or two armies or two actually several characters in a main event and we are invested in everyone's story like Rachel's saying mm -hmm. 
I, you like me were like, don't bro, don't die, Braun. Don't yeah, die. Yeah. Don't die, Jamie. Yeah. You fall for it all because you're so invested. This is a great point you bring up, Ken, if you watch. The twists and turns in a match make the match amazing. In this mm -hmm. battle, at one point, it looks like a complete slaughter. The Dothraki coming out of the flames like demons from hell, yeah. stomping on the <laughs> yeah. charred bodies of Lannister soldiers. All of that chopping off horses, like that sound of the horse wail will oh. live like yeah. oh, forever in my ears. Just the, the sound of it was so terrible. But that's two different styles two powerful styles and the Lannisters are still holding them off those dragon that but Drogon is just destroying yeah. everything and then Bronn runs in, grabs a scorpion, shoots that, and the first arrow, and there's nothing like seeing Danny astride that dragon finally once and for all. It was so um, yeah. I don't know, I don't want to say a hard up but a geek on. I got a nerd on like just watching that going in and then her destroying everything. But yeah. then the the huge arrow coming through. So then you're switching. You're like, oh no, not true. So it's great yeah. to see the switches. And this is the point where I start going behind the, my wall because yeah. I see the arrows. Because I'm like, no, I don't want to see Dragon die. But then, and then when he gets hit, and then he, you're mm -hmm. like, you think, oh, the what's sound. this mean? The sound of it, right? And then yeah. is it going to crash? Is Danny going to die? Like, what's going to happen here? So there's so many twists and turns throughout it. And Dick on right, they give us just enough of Dick of humanizing Dick on when he has the exchange about people crapping their pants. That when we see him save Jamie by yeah. stabbing that guy. Mm -hmm. After Jamie had made fun of not getting his name right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then all this, so we see everything going through his eyes. And then when we get that ground level shot of Braun when he falls off the horse, uh, and yeah. we see the dragon go overhead, and we see all this. <laughs> there was so similar to the Battle of Bastards with Jon Snow, we were down yeah, on the ground yeah. level with him. Yeah. So there's so much about this battle that was absolutely beautiful to experience and watch. And all the twists and turns kept you as a viewer going forward because there was a victory, but seeing Tyrion see his sadness was everything to me because he's watching Lannister people, mm -hmm. soldiers that yeah. he may have commanded in the Blackwater battle yeah, yeah. now getting destroyed here in front of him, seeing his twists and turns like a manager that goes and yeah, manages yeah. another wrestler, yeah. Paul Bearer with Kane against Undertaker. <laughs> it's just the sadness there. So Yeah, absolutely. I loved it. There's a, it's like Dennis, in, the, in that moment with Braun, when he goes and gets the Scorpion, mm -hmm. great moment, mm -hmm. shoots the Dothraki guy, and I'm like, get, get, the, get another arrow on there. <laughs> <laughs> in that moment, I'm thinking, yes, Kill Drogon. And then I'm like, but little baby Drogon was so cute. <laughs> like he was crawling on his mom. Like my head's exploded at this moment. Yeah, I didn't want him personally to kill Drogon, but I feel like uh, Tyrion, uh, he was kind of a substitute for, for us, the viewer, yeah. because he's watching from afar and he's also emotionally invested. I mean, he, he doesn't have a look, even though they're clearly winning this battle, mm -hmm. he doesn't have a look of like pride. He's not happy about it. He's very disturbed and sad because yeah. he knows. That yeah. his brother, who he loves dearly, is out there on the mm -hmm. battlefield, and he may die. Is he going to get burnt alive from Drogon? Is he going to get killed by uh, one of the Dothrakis? Yeah. So he's out there, uh, like we are watching, going, no, 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 no. Okay, they're fighting, it, but don't, don't, you know, don't die. And then the whole thing with, with after Drogon hits the ground and, and he yeah. sees Jamie, he's like, he's oh, like, flee, flee, yeah. flee, you idiot, flee. Yeah. He's talking to himself and. Or trying to talk to to, yeah. to Jamie, and, and you know Jamie, he, he wouldn't let it go. Yeah. Grabs that spear and just runs at Danny. You mm. know that no good thing is gonna happen. <laughs> no good thing ha happen from that. In that moment, Dennis, when yeah. you and I are, are watching separate yeah. homes, watching late at night, everyone's tweeted in. I'm I'm seeing seeing my friends on Facebook. Yeah. What an episode! I thought. I didn't think Jamie was gonna die. We talked about being mm, protected uh, by plot armor yeah. off camera, Rachel. But <laughs> I thought I I I I was so gripped in that moment. Did you think he was gonna kill Drogon? What did you think was gonna happen? Uh, I mean, because of what we talked about how we 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 watched it later than everyone else. Yeah. I was expecting somebody to die in this episode, mm -hmm. and once yes. we got to the battle, it was like, who is it? Is it Jamie? Is yeah. it Bronn? Is it Danny? Is it Drogon? It's you know, it's like who who's gonna die? Turns out it was just horses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean. um, so in, in that moment, I, I was fearful that that someone would save him and then also die, right. like right. Braun or something like that. Right. So he did save him, but they both f fell into the water. Hmm. Rachel, should someone have died in this fight? I think it's my only quibble because uh, I feel like with a battle of this magnitude and. A horrific carnage in the way it went down that there should be consequences mm -hmm. uh, you know and in I mean I, I the entire time I'm like well Bra Braun this is it for Braun like yeah. I, I was just waiting for the moment it would happen I thought it was gonna be when he loosed the second arrow that actually hit Drogon he wouldn't jump right. from the scorpion quickly enough and he'd be roasted like I totally thought that's what was gonna happen and so when nobody did and, and you just mentioned off camera we talked about 
I wouldn't have hated if they'd killed Jamie because it would have been so unexpected. But then I would have thought about it and I wouldn't have liked it because there's still too much unresolved with right. Cersei and with the knowledge he just got from Olena. And there's still something, there's moves for him to play that would make his death in this battle feel um, unsatisfactory for a character arc. So I never right. fully believed that he would die. I did for about a minute or two, think Drogon was going down. Yeah, mm. like I, I was like, I, they, are they really gonna do this? So th that they got me that far is something. Yeah. But I will say that the the absolute cherry on the top would have been even if it had been Dickon. You know, mm. There had to be, uh, like I said, a consequence or a sacrifice for a battle of this, you know, horrific magnitudes. Yeah. I feel like yeah, that we, we might happen. we might assume Dickon and Randall Tarly are dead, but again, we didn't see True. it. We didn't see that. But John, you know what we're talking about here? It's it's the Landel Carisian thing. Yeah. Should he have died in Return of the Jedi? Should there be an, a cost for the rebellion of, of the people that we know and are invested in? Yeah. Do you think that could have happened? Well, here? Um, Rachel and I were texting last night as this was happening, and mm -hmm. and I was saying to her, I would have loved, I would have kind of loved to have seen uh, Jamie die because the internet would have exploded in the <laughs> hysterics, and you know we would have had something even more insane to talk about. And Braun, I think a I agree with Rachel. It bothered me a little bit the first time I watched it. Even I was like, "Why does he keep escaping death? It's too convenient." Like that rolling caravan of fire that stops mm -hmm. the Dothraki from getting him. Him jumping off the scorpion before he uh, Dragon burns it, and then him saving Jamie and jumping in the. I was like, "That was a little three. Three is too many to escape death right. from a dragon, in my opinion." <laughs> and so I would have liked to have seen Braun. And I believe if George R. R. Martin, this is what I texted mm -hmm. Rachel, if George R. R. Martin was still writing this. But he Braun would have absolutely died. Yeah, the thing, and because he has no qualm about killing people in these moments. And, and the thing we know with Braun is Braun's been inserted to the story yes. greatly because Jerome Flynn is awesome, oh, yeah. and I love Braun, and yeah. I don't want him to go. But I would have right. understood in that moment absolutely. because what does he have to do in the story that's been planned for twenty mm -hmm. years? We'll find out. Dennis, yeah. uh, uh, you, you you understand what I'm saying? You know, here like should Braun have gone? The, I mean, the, the, it's the story possible. Need that? They, they also you know kind of divert you and kind of. Uh, falsely foreshadowed a death yeah. with him mm. him talking yes. about the castle mm -hmm. and one, one once they kind of focus in on a character that maybe usually isn't the focal point and then he's right. talking about future things that's always a, a not a not a good sign not so, a good so i thought i thought maybe he would have <laughs> hit drogon and then that he out of, out of everyone in the battle i thought he was the most likely to die right. i mean yeah yeah but they hey they they don't. The horses get charred. Danny's got fear in her face. I think she thought she was dying because to me, Jamie actually was going for Danny in that mm -hmm. moment. But they're in the water. A great ending because I hadn't breathed, uh, you know, for 30 seconds. In the sound. <laughs> <sighs> and the credits roll. You're like, I can function. I can breathe again. But in the time we have re remaining here, guys, I think it's important to talk about next week. Mm -hmm. Episodes titled East Watch. So we know there's going to be some White Walker action, but there's a lot of foreshadowing. I think this is going to be the big question coming out of this week, and it was a little bit going into this. Has Danny John begun her turn to the dark side of yeah, the force? We've seen this throughout the whole season so far, this under this oh, this uh, storyline of her wanting to be different than everyone else, but then this undercurrent of being unable to resist the impulse to be like everybody else. She wants to be a different leader, but push comes to shove. She re relies on the old tactics that everyone is using. Right. Just because she didn't use the dragon to Red Keep does not still mean that this oh. story of her using the dragon isn't going to creep back right. into people at Winterfell. Be like, yep, she's a crazy one. She has this ability. She could wipe us out at any moment. It'll only help Cersei twist it in the manipulative way that she can in the press, so to speak, you know, in yeah. the news about it. And so we've got this idea, but then we see her like saying to them, you would bet, this is her hashtag bend the knee. This is her yeah. thing throughout this whole season. <laughs> bend the knee. She says that in the in the yeah. trailer for next week, and I think we see Randall Tarley up front because his bald head's there, as big as unmistakable. Yeah, yeah. And so she, we see her kind of making this moves, and we see Tyrion, and we see that line where he says like, uh, "You've got to do something to convince her to stop being <laughs> this way." So yeah. we see her embracing her power. She wants that hunger. She believes we saw at the beginning when she had that interaction with Jon Snow. I deserve to be on that, and I will be the queen of the Seven Kingdoms. So yeah. they, we're seeing her uh, stubbornness and her dr uh, drive yeah. combine into one, and it's a scary combination it at this point. It is. Rachel, I mean, how, right now she's going to be like, see, I was right. Yeah, right. This is what I was supposed to do. I'm going to get on my dragons. I'm going to go burn shit. So... She it's, might be going. She might be making this turn. Absolutely. It's the classic story of people who fall into villainy. The best villains don't think they're villains. Right. And I mean, look at Roka. Right. <laughs> exactly. Truth. So it, it's like um, what they were saying earlier in the episode, this idea of 
you know, uh, wanting to change the world, break the wheel. Her heart is in the right place. The things she wants, she wants a better world. That is still, I think, the case. And she's tried it other ways. She tried it the clever ways, and it didn't work. And she has this arsenal at her disposal. And she's got Targaryen blood mm -hmm. flowing through her veins. And there is something about that house, those people that, you know, fire and blood, their house words for a reason. So right. it, everything around her is failing. So she's starting to lean on that one thing that makes her a Targaryen. And if that works, she won her first battle. Yeah. yeah. You know, so so there's the legitimate argument to to go down this road, despite John's speech to her on the beach, and despite you know clearly they're two leaders that want to remake the world into a more democratic yeah. place. There's some good intentions there, but mm. but it's so hard to actually enact change in a world that is this steeped in the way things are, right. and what the world knows is that the strongest and the most powerful and the most the richest, you know, they rule with an iron fist because right. that's the way that this world works. So it's it's heartbreaking to see a slide like that when you know that she wants the right things, but I mean, she she very well could go mad, mad queen oh. to be the daughter of her father in this instance. She's got it in her, Dennis. She's got this mad king heiress blood here going on. <laughs> is she is she Palpatine? <laughs> is she Vader? <laughs> or is just just someone like John said up top, what I think is a great point. She's driven, and she knows she might be right. Mm -hmm. To me, she falls into, and this can be related to, to real life, where people just, who buy too much into their own hype. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's like hearing from other people. Oh, you're the one. You're the one. Oh, you're you're supposed to be queen. You, it's like JTE all, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Bibiani. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, and so she's getting that into her head, and she's like, Oh, well, I'm the mother of dragons. You know, like I said, like she's starting to believe. Look, it's okay to, to believe in yourself and be confident, but she's going beyond that. She's becoming like whatever the, the kind of like the the myth of her, uh, of who she is now has become. She's bought into it. Like, okay, right. I am the legend. I'm destined to be this, you know. And yeah. and, and so this battle is not going to help because she's gonna be like, okay, I came in there with the dragon. I kicked ass. I slayed everyone. I'm just gonna do this from from now on. This is the game plan. Right. And, and, and that's. Obviously, Tyrion's not a good military strategist, right. but politically, he knows what to do, and she may not be able to differentiate between those two. So when she gets advice about some other stuff that maybe he knows about, she may not listen, and, yeah. and, and just she's she's stubborn. We'll you know, see. And we see this happening in the in the inner geekdom with Rachel Cushing. Like hey she now. Was, All right, let's stay on you know, topic, she was guys. Slow, and now we see her talking into the camera, <laughs> destroying Kalinowski, yeah. saying she wants everyone. I, I'm that's a little right. worried. This I'm a little worried of the turn that's happening the fire here. Fire queen right here. You know what? The true <laughs> test might be when my man, Sir Jor Mormont, uh -huh. returns. And what will he find? Will this be the Danny that oh, he loved? Yeah. Or will he look Great and go, point. this is not my queen? Or he might be like, yeah, all right, I'll kill for you. We'll <laughs> see. Next week, East Watch. I don't think I've ever anticipated a follow-up episode to a battle episode mm. than this one. Usually it's late in the season. And we, this one is going to have some ramifications next week in East Watch. That, that means we're going to see our friend the Night King. Could be the end for some very important characters. We will see, though, uh, as we head north and east to East Watch <laughs> by the sea. We might see Hound, Tormund, Barrack, uh, Thor, Samir, and see if Jon Snow can get out of Dragonstone. Guys, that is it for today. We got to wrap it up. I want to thank to every, everyone watching in the live chat. Big numbers today watching. That's what happens when dragons burn things. We all want to get <laughs> together and discuss it. You can continue the conversation during the week following us on Twitter or Collider Video on Twitter and using the hashtag Thrones talk. Before we go, I want to say so thanks to Cody Hall, who gets up so nice and early and <laughs> sets up this studio. When I got here, he was already here about an hour. Thanks, Cody, for your work. Dennis, as we sign out, where they can follow you uh, this week. Yeah, you guys can chat Ed's about Game of Thrones or, or anything else on Twitter at Think Hero or on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Absolutely, John Roca. Yeah, you guys can always find me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, see all the shows I'm hosting and co-hosting and uh, podcasts and things I'm writing. Absolutely. Rachel Cushing, who's probably got her own dragons ready to burn the inner geekdom <laughs> in the movie trivia schmodown. 
Uh, yeah, please follow me on Twitter, uh, Rachel J. Cushing. I'm glad to talk more about this episode. There's so many one-liners. We didn't even mention that Davos made a grammar joke in honor yes. of yes. our good departed well, Stannis I mean, Baratheon. Yes. Fewer. So, yeah, fewer, fewer, exactly. <laughs> so there was so much to unpack here, and yeah. I will be talking and tweeting about this all week. So come join yeah. me. And uh, I know, Rachel, next week you got some uh, personal commitments. You won't be here. We'll yes. have a good guest host in your place. But okay. as always, get to talk history with you here Game of Thrones. It is so good to have your perspective. If that's it, you can follow me at Ken Napsuck for all the wonderful things I do. I talk Game of Thrones daily. Just follow me on Twitter and find on out. We'll see you guys next week. Let's go burn some stuff. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.